welcoming me today. That is going to be sitting in the audience. But hello, my name is Mary McCauley. I'm the mayor of the city of Issaquah. And we're really happy to have our fifth district delegates here today. So we have uh, Senator Mark Mullen and. <laughs> Representative Lisa Callan. And Representative Bill Ramos. So this is their third and final stop today. They've also been to North Bend and Maple Valley. And so I hope you've got some really tough questions lined up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Adam, and I work with Senator Mullen, and I'll be doing the questions today. So if you have questions that um, you want to write down on the little note cards, you can hand them to Zach in the back of the way from here, Zach. And uh, yeah, so over in Erica too, she can run around and grab them. And uh, so yeah, we are going to do some introductions. Uh, would anyone who's a local elected official stand up um, and introduce themselves to the group? Okay. Hi, Tim Harris, uh, City Council, Carnation. There's former Mayor Fred Butler. Former Mayor Butler. We get out. All right, so we're going to do some introductions and then we'll uh, jump into questions. Yeah, there you go. Well, thank you so much for being here, Bill Ramos, and uh, appreciate you taking your time on a Saturday afternoon. And it's just really nice to be here to get to share a little bit of information. And, Um, just a, a quick uh, overview. I'm, I'm on the Transportation, the uh, Agricultural and Natural Resources Committee, and the uh, Colleges and Workforce Committee. So a lot of things I'm working on are in the environmental side, natural resource side, and transportation. Um, and we'll let that go. I'm Lisa Callan, and I serve on the Saving the state money. <laughs> we all do share that space and, and frequently find um, either Zach or Eric or Adam in that office, and sometimes all three, so like it's a little bit elbow to elbow for them. Um, and then we will often meet right here in this space, so <coughs> it's like our diet plan. None of us can gain weight if we do the opposite. <laughs> I'm Mark Mullen, and this is my eighth time doing one of these. I think one of the things we always like to highlight when we begin is some of the capital budget projects that are happening in the neighborhood. And, and these even years are smaller than the odd years where we have bigger projects. But even in an even year, we did get money for Issaquah School District to convert the old ag building down by, you know, Issaquah Valley Elementary School to a couple of preschool classrooms. And so we're trying to partner with the district so we could add some public preschool in place in Issaquah where we think it would make a big difference. And, on the transportation front, you can see some of the projects that have started with, like the Costco project, that was something that we started with Mayor Butler here, the first year I was in the Senate of getting the state to partner with the city and Costco and redoing that. Now people have obviously discovered those roundabouts and the new ways around by the Pickering Center. Uh, we can see the construction of East Falls City Road is finally happening by PCMS. I know it's a heading now, but it's gonna make life a lot better. <laughs> so we'll have four lanes all the way to the Kalani entrance. And, uh, and you can see the lanes on I-90 are, are happening right now as well. And those will open up this year as well, the extra lanes between here and Eastgate. And everything on Highway 18 is going to full steam ahead. We're happy to say that even though we had some challenges with the Highway Initiative, that project, because it's been so dangerous and met so many fatalities, we were able to make sure that was not one of the projects that got put on hold. So it's moving forward. We're told that we talk too much the other ones. We can get to our questions, so with that, I am shutting up so we can get through as many questions as humanly possible. Do you want to say what your committees are? Oh, my committees are, I've been on education for eight years. I have six kids in the Israel Public School System, fourth through eleventh grade, and I'm also on the Ways and Means Committee and do the capital budget, so Representative Callan and I kind of take team the capital budget, and I chair the banking committee. That was my background before pizza and ice cream was finance, so I am the chair of the financial institutions. 
question is, um, how does the $30 car tax initiative impact the clean fuel standard? <laughs> I'm not so sure they're directly related. Um, I'll try to answer each of them individually more so. Uh, the uh, initiative 976, which passed, um, which got you know supposedly down to $30 car tax and never quite get there, but um, took a lot of money out of our transportation budget. Um, if you look at just this year alone coming up, it's almost a half a billion dollars. So the effect of that is projects are not getting done. You can't take a half a billion dollars out of the budget and, and keep doing everything you were doing. So there's been delays on some projects the governor put in and, and uh, we're currently working on how to adjust that budget. Hopefully within the next week we'll, we'll get an uh, answer to that from the Senate and the House put those two together. Uh, so it, it's having a, a big impact. And the clean fuels is kind of unrelated uh, to the car caps, but it uh, is working to hopefully keep move our transportation sector into be, uh, uh, producing less greenhouse gases. As I say, we have a lot of little little power plants moving all around, and they're hard to, to work on versus some of our uh, where some of our greenhouse gases come from or pretty stationary. We can work to reduce those. It's harder in the transportation sector than it is one of our other sectors. So the greenhouse gas. Or the clean fuel model is to uh, help reduce what's coming out of the tailpipes of each of those cars individually and trucks as well and uh, in a better standard and we create those fuels right here in the state right now most of them are shipped down to california and oregon because that's where they have those standards and they sell those fuels down there instead of us using them here so that'll help that industry as well stole it off didn't it yeah. <laughs> well and I, I think the big takeaway i think from the tab thing is because you're paying a big lump sum to be, I think the message of the legislature is when you're doing revenue for transportation, TAPS is not the place to go. We've had, I think, three of these now. Issaquah, to be honest, voted against 976, and we actually have the highest TAPS. But, I mean, Maple Valley, Black Diamond, and Suquamie North Bend are all outside of the sound transit taxing zone, so their TAPS are hundreds of dollars cheaper than the TAPS that we pay here. We actually were the one area in our district that did reject 976. Regardless, the message was very clear to the state that we have to find ways we're gonna raise money for transportation, that you're doing it in bits and pieces, not in like a $200 cab fee when you have to renew your vehicle. So I think those are the things we're trying to figure out in the transportation package going forward is how we can do that. Um, what is being done to make schools safer for LGBTQ uh, students? So last session, there was a bill that was passed that was a specific uh, strengthening of the harassment, intimidation, and bullying bill um, that was adding policy that really called out LGBTQ transgender students. Um, and that is because we know that the extensive rate of bullying and um, discipline data that we're getting is uh, highly impacting uh, students that um, identify as LGBTQ and transgender. So, School districts, schools, every school building should be a safe place to be able to learn no matter who you are um, and how you're showing up to that classroom every day. The, um, it's all about learning and it's all about uh, feeling safe and having capacity to do that, and that's the job of our school district. And on a debate, in last session we did one of the states that banned conversion therapy, and I don't say sitting on the education see students, transgender students, or, or gay students, and, and I think it's the challenge of social media, like bullying of kids now, it seems like it's gotten harder than it was even when we were in school, just the last 30 years, so I think not having the face-to-face -face thing. Kids were mean, I felt like when I was in school, and now, because they can do it through social media, it's definitely even worse, and, I, and when you look at the suicide rates of this segment of our population, it is shocking. So anyone, I think when you look at that information, you can't help but kind of have it pull your heartstrings and realize that just overall, not just the government, but society, we have to find ways to be more accepting of this entire population. Um, what is being done on the environment this year? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, uh, a number of things we just talked about.
talk about the clean fuel uh, uh, standards, which it is in, in when we're in this point right now, the House has passed their bills and the Senate has passed their bills and then we trade back and forth, right? So it has to get passed both houses. So this is one of the bills that's gotten passed one, so now it goes to the Senate. Uh, it was also passed last year, but didn't get all the way through to the end. Um, and uh, other things we have been, I, I personally have a bill on carbon sequestration that I'm very proud of, um, trying to get our, our forest, our working forest, and our agriculture area to do what they can. Mother Nature is the way that has their own process of getting uh, rid of carbon and by processing to our plants. And so do what we can. Most uh, of these carbon type bills, reduction bills, tend to be on a partisan basis. I'm really proud of the fact that this carbon sequestration bill had a unanimous vote out of the House. Um, so we crossed party lines, we did work together to get that to, so that it's working in the long run. And uh, hopefully now this bill is up to the Senate to uh, get, uh, get concurred. So over there. Uh, you just mentioned it. Uh, transportation, there's been 
there were a bunch of questions on transportation. Uh, this one specifically mentioned uh, unincorporated areas, uh, but do you want to maybe touch on uh, what's happening with transportation at the state level? I'll, I'll throw around, we haven't talked about it too much yet, and it's a bill that, that you talk about some of these things take more than a year to get done. And one of the things I know from my work with my city council and, and traveling across the state is that our local transportation issues are not being dealt with. I mean, cities and counties do not have the funding to deal with their issues. And, and if you're all here and you have, what, $100 million of you know, projects you want to implement. So if I were to try to find a way for these local areas to get find the funding for that. So we are bill to start this year that maybe we'll get passed next year is to find some funding sources that the local areas can pass, not from the state level, just the authority for cities and counties to pass some, some revenue generating items that can fund their local projects, which you all know what's best. And if you know what's best here in Isabel, you know, other people know what's best in your Freda, whatever their local area is, what they need to do and how they need to do this, and it gives them some options. Uh, and so that's one of the things we're looking about in the long term uh, in transportation. And that, that bill got a hearing in the Senate and the House side, which is my goal this year. So next year we've got the discussion started. Is, is, uh, in the calendar that we get the discussion started, get folks talking about it, work to a final uh, solution that can be passed. I want to say one huge downside of the energy issue is there is two projects globally that got put on hold that were set to go forward this year. One is, I call it the tolling center section, is where you're turning into like DCC and then, you know, you're coming on and that's right on our exit 15. And then we had money moved from the intersection. If anyone has been to the intersection, those are sucks. The backups, you know, when you're coming out of like the Michaels PCC area are ridiculous. And uh, that project got put on hold. We're trying to unhold. We all signed a letter along with our delegation from the neighboring district, 41st, Belfamers Island, signed a delegation to get it released from, from hold. And we're still working on that. Further planning for as well as we Right now we have the money to go to Kalani. The plan is to keep going down to you know be really broke and uh, so that's gonna but we need to find money and we have it put in the budget, but once again these were two projects in our local community that got put on hold when the 976 initiative passed. And so we'll see. You know, I personally am always on a roundabout mission. I've never been at the intersection that I want to turn into a roundabout. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
gas tax money is tied by the Eighteenth Amendment. We can only use gas tax money on roads. But there is zero that takes sales tax money and B&O tax money and property tax money that flows into the state. There's nothing at all that prevents us from using that money to help out the transportation budget. And I think going forward, we have to find a way to get a, a better balance. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck in traffic forever. Okay. I know we weren't thinking of funds, but I'm not thinking of funds. I'd be so remiss if I didn't say that it's a whole community and well-being is tied to what Senator Mullen just said about investments in, in education. Talking about where we're putting our education dollars is really uh, that early intervention and that early learning support and what we're doing from birth to kindergarten readiness is, has such a huge return on investment that if we actually had, I think, you know, adaptive fiscal notes about what you would gain in it, we would we would have been putting a lot more money there sooner um, and now. So I just that's another big, huge economic driver. Uh, the next question uh, was about the recent revenue forecast. It says there's a really large revenue uh, forecast, um, and how is that money being spent, and will it be spent on tax relief? Well, let the finance guy jump on that. <laughs> well, well, so we had, in 2018 session, we had, we took our revenue lower, we did provide a property tax cut. I don't know if people even noticed it in there. But your property tax bill last year should have gone down from the year before. Uh, I noticed when I got my bill last week that it has now gone back up because that was one year temporary relief. Um, I, I think that my hope is we, we take some of this revenue growth to figure out, for one, how we make sure we don't blow it all <laughs> in the sense that if the recession hits us, then we're not now having to cut a bunch of programs that we put in place after like a very, I mean, it's been 11 year economic run going back to 2009. Uh, but the, at the same time, it's just kind of, I don't think there's gonna, my sense is there's not gonna be immediate tax relief flowing out between now and March 12th. I think the more likely scenario, and this sounds weird to say, but when we did the big tax cut in 2018, I don't know if anybody even noticed. I mean, it was $390 million, that was my bill. And, and we didn't hear anything in our office, whereas I think when we do some of the investments, like whether it's in affordable housing and other things, we seem to get a lot more feedback from people. And so I think we have strong revenue growth. So even though we're not, I'm not, I have no anxiety about there being new taxes introduced to the legislature between now and March 12th, which I'm happy about. It seems like the conversation based on the fact that we did this big tax cut in 2018 and no one seemed to notice, it seems like more of the talk is how we prioritize what we invest in and try to invest in one time. So if we do have a recession that hits us, we're not committing to long-term investments, we're picking one-time investments. That's what I'm guessing we'll see between now and March 12th when session ends. I think the other aspect to what we're seeing and what we need to pay attention to is um, certainly being recession-proof, um, knowing you know it's coming sooner or later. But the other the other aspect to it is with our increased growth in demand in our state is also the increased growth in demand on our services, right? Um, one of the big um, things that I know that all of us heard about was nursing home closures and how that's tied to our Medicaid rates and, and what's happening with all of that. So when you start talking about pocketbook issues and what that means to you in terms of your property tax or, or, or tax relief um, versus other ways to relieve that pain in your pocketbook, when you talk about healthcare costs, when you talk about the cost of insulin, when you talk about um, your transportation costs because you're spending more time in your car, all of that. So these are all things that we can do and we can use some of that revenue to try to re reduce that, that angst and that pain and also support the systems and the survivability of everybody to try to make that happen. So I think that's a, a balance that we're hearing and we're trying to figure out um, that also provides income to people when they're, you know, they're working in facilities and, and certainly also in child care, right? The subsidy rates that come through for um, child care providers is very low and, and hitting minimum wage and that doesn't give them the ability to actually own a home um, and some of course don't even pay rent. So when you're looking at those aspects, you're also trying to figure out all of those elements that are also very much pocketbook issues that we're trying to resolve and make the cost of living in general. Um, you're part of that, that cost of living pie or manageable. I'm going to set it all. I just add a little bit that you know um, when we're down there talking to folks and all of you folks who come down to visit or other folks, they come and they talk to us about things and they always ask for something that costs money. It's something, it's something 
they care about. And most of these things are good things. I mean, they're not bad. They're good things, but they cost money. No one's come down and said, please stop spending money. You know, I mean, because they want good things. And so it's that balancing act of, of taking the funds we have, spreading them across all the areas that, that need that, and keeping in mind that the, the immediate need, those things that we really need to take care of, uh, mentioned like Medicare payments to, to uh, senior uh, living, right? That's important and that's now. But the other thing is balance that with, to me, the education side that Representative Cowell talked about. That's gonna pay us back tenfold in the long run, right? We get our kids educated from early learning to all the way through, you know, uh, higher ed. They're gonna continue to pay back into society for a long time with all, all their education. So it's, it's balancing that long-term payback with the short-term term need of what's, what we need right now. I think the place where there's the best chance for some probably tax relief for these people in this room is on the sound transit appreciation schedule for your vehicles. I, I think you can't amend an initiative for two years afterwards, but the bill idea that I heard floating around this last week is saying if the court were to overturn the sound transit portion of the Ironman initiative, which is what I think a lot of people who are lawyers, which I'm not one, but people who are lawyers think there's a high probability of that portion of the initiative getting overturned. Well, the idea is we could have a simple majority vote to say if that were to happen, we're going to change the appreciation schedule on sound transit uh, to back to what it should be, where you know it acknowledges the fact that the second you drive your car off the lot, it's kind of a huge drop in its value by 10 or 20 percent, and the current schedule doesn't acknowledge that. But I, I think that will be one small potential place where we can try to find some property tax relief between now and March. Uh, the next question, we had a lot of questions on this. Um, what is the status of, the, of gun legislation this year? So uh, we had someone mention the high capacity magazine bills, uh, assault weapons uh, ban, and uh, creation of the Office of Firearm Violence Prevention, uh, and restricting weapons in certain locations. So I can remind you of those two. Well, the, there's only two out of this that are alive. It's the Office of Firearm Prevention is alive, and saying you can't bring guns in the early learning centers is alive. And I'm guessing those will be the two that, that will make it, I think, to the finish line this session. And to be honest, that we've seen when we are interviewing a lot of it's mixed reactions. I mean, there's a lot of people who are really happy with that because a lot of the other bigger ideas got in. There's also a lot of people extremely upset with that. And I think our, our request is, you know, we have obviously a lot of people who feel very strongly about the Second Amendment to reach out to our office. We have a lot of people on the other side who want to see more things around gun responsibility put on the books. And, and so as long as we can keep those two sides being respectful of each other going forward, uh, I think it'll be a good outcome. And, but this session, there's not going to be any earth shattering changes except for the two we just mentioned, which I think are more incremental. Which are those two? So the Office of Firearm Prevention is just saying the state level you could study and look at firearms, challenge with firearms. There's been a challenge that's not funded at the federal level, so that funding was banned. So the idea was to use some state dollars to try to gather information about you could correct that problem. The other one is you can't bring guns in the early learning center. So I think on these issues, uh, Representative Cowell mentioned the Medicare
from my perspective as a legislator, the part that um, I find frustrating is when you have these complex issues and you have a high passion around them, the goal that we have to really strive for is we all want to have um, fewer deaths by guns. We all want to reduce violence by guns. So how do we further that and how do we get to where we need to be? One, we get data, we make sure we're, we're making our policy smart. Then we understand where the, um, the pinch points are on the policy and we work it. So the more we can debate it, the more we can have a conversation around it, the more we're gonna move that policy forward, we're gonna get it to a point that's actually gonna move the dial on gun violence. And we can't stop having that conversation and we gotta do it in a way where we can talk to each other and we can actually make something happen and move forward in that way. Um, we know the statistics are out there on a national level, we need to know what's happening locally and we just, um, I'm a little frustrated that we didn't get to have a floor of conversation around it so I could hear what was happening and we could figure out how to, to move it and mature it and make it happen. So I'm hoping that this bill that did get dropped will continue to have that happen and so we can we can continue the progress of really figuring out, um, just like we're doing with every other health crisis, like we're doing with the opioid the, the, uh, crisis, what we're doing with the price of insulin, we're going at it trying to figure out how to save lives. And that's the way we need to look at it, and I think we can all come together and figure that out as well. Uh, questions? Do you have to speed up? We are halfway done with the questions, and about halfway done with the time. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what bills have you personally passed that you are most excited about this year? I love these open-ended questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, hard to, they're hard to answer. Just <laughs> <laughs> One bill. <laughs> uh, I, I think I mentioned my already the car sequestration with the unanimous vote that took a lot of, of work to get people sitting down and the point of that for me was to get everybody in this, under the same tent so we could talk about as we move forward on carpet issues from here on out we now have a common language to talk about working together so we can do that that was that was uh, uh, that was just my biggest uh, accomplishment in, in doing that so now we can move that forward as we go and have serious conversations because now we're all so I think we have well over a thousand bills that have um, passed one of the chambers. We're likely to only pass out of both chambers and signed by the government 300 to 400. So a lot of bills will go away. Yeah, um, your ASB card bill are also strong for the brain. <laughs> I know, uh, it, it's a great, it's a great bill. I, I am really thoroughly um, am excited about all the bills that I have, and I had eight that passed off of the floor. Um, I think one will be carried by the Senate, and so I had seven that are in play, and I'm very excited about. Um, the one that Senator Mullen is talking about is one that came from students um, here out of the Issaquah School District, and that was to make sure that we had the National Crisis Line on every student ID card, every staff ID card. Um, it's a very uh, simple thought. Um, the Issaquah School District actually already does this. Uh, several of our districts in the fifth are already doing this, but that's not the case across the state. We use the National Crisis Line because that is a steady, um, reliable number that no matter where you go will always be there and be accessible for you. Um, and the federal level, the FCC is moving towards a 988 number, like a 911 number for crisis intervention. So we're trying to stay um, really linked and being able to promote that. But the idea is that we can, you know, literally put into hundreds of thousands of students across our state. You know, we have 1.1 million students in our K-12 system, and then we're also including um, any higher ed or programs, community colleges, um, every, everybody that already provides a, a student ID or staff ID will include this number on it, so it's right there whenever we need it. There's a lot more, so if you want to listen to my bill, I'll be happy to share it with you. I have nine bills that passed the Senate. I don't expect all nine bills to go to the Senate through the House. It's not going to be to do that, right? Uh, my wife teaches at Sunny Hills Elementary, and one of the things I noticed is counselors a lot of times in schools get told in a variety of different directions that have nothing to do with counseling. And so, like, they need to proctor tests, and they have a counselor to proctor tests, and they need help with recess, and they have a counselor to help with recess. And the bill just is very simple. It just says 80% of the counselor's time has to be spent on doing counselor duties. It's, it's kind of a backdoor way to force districts to say, if you need other bodies who do other things, hire other bodies, but don't take someone who's got a master's degree in an area where we have dire extreme need in the state and have them doing duties that 
is not what they went to college and got a master's for. And so I think they've just become utility players in schools by default in the last 30 years. And we've heard loud and clear that we need counselors. We focus on big counselors and, and we're not allowing them to get distracted and pulled in a different direction. So thank you guys for your for that bill next week. Hopefully it's a very tight time limit. All the bills we sent to the house have until Friday, end of business, to pass. If they don't, they're dead. And so Same with the Senate. I know, same with the Senate. So you think about that, it's like, we've been down there for a month, you have a week and a half for the opposite chamber to hear all the bills you passed and decide if they want us to keep any of them alive or not. So it's a very short process in 60 days. It forces us to make decisions. Uh, what is being done to make our state tax system less regressive? And then on top of that, do you support uh, raising, allowing councils to have councils, city councils and county councils to have the authority to raise the sales tax uh, to uh, fund affordable housing? So, so there's, there's two questions there. Um, one is uh, talking about council matter authority versus Constant conversation over where that goes. Um, to use an example of the bill I talked about earlier on local transportation issues, there's a, there's a blend of options there. You you vote your elected officials in, whether it's the city council or school board or us, to do a lot of work for you, right? And and sometimes we need to come back for a vote. That's true. And and that takes usually a lot of time and, and a fair amount of money to do that. So it needs to be really to me an important step. To so it's kind of balancing that fact of what you want your representatives to do for you versus how often they want to come back, take a vote uh, on everything. We don't want to do that, that's too cumbersome. So balancing that is, is something that is, is uh, up for a lot of discussion. And then, progressive taxes. Um, that's a tough one. We don't really have many progressive taxes in the state. And that's one of the things we like to change. We're not doing much in that arena right now. So there's a, um, a committee um, that is working on ideas of general tax reform and trying to figure out how to make our tax structure for our state less regressive. Um, I actually said you know, the body of that work group. I think it's a joint legislative body. Um, certainly there's a, I think it's joint. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so while that work is going on, because you know we've had several um, votes from the people on the income tax and various things, right, uh, trying to figure that all out, I think this is a, a huge question, a very complex question, and there's a lot going on. But I think as we're looking for solutions, um, and depending on what our revenue forecasts are and where we're going, even the transportation package and how you fund that and what's going to be that mechanism outside of gas tax and how you, how you think about that. And you talked about right now when you buy a, a tank of gas, um, you're spending that a certain amount of that tax rate is going into the state, and you buy more gas and you are spending more miles on the road. And so the substitute option that people are talking about is a road use tax, again, that you're using based off the road use. But if you can't afford to live where you work and you're driving right away, and you're, you've got that minimum wage job, then you're also, I mean, that becomes a regressive tax, right? So it's certainly not an easy thing. And I think certainly around affordable housing and things that we're seeing around trying to um, bring people in from outside and inside on what we're doing, making those decisions and conversations that we're having in the legislature around the tools and the toolbox for city councils. We're hearing from city council, they want more tools. I think that there's not a city council member, and um, you know, I can look Brendan and I, and I'm sure he'll shake his head, that would take a council mad and vote easily on any tax increase. So I I think that um, it's good to provide tools in the toolbox. I think it's good to um, allow local control on these issues so that you can really uh, address what it is that you want. You can have local input into um, the deciding body or your ballot at the ballot box of where you want to spend your tax dollars on. And hopefully we can do that. And I think the primary challenge that I had in mind is I, I understand making the tax more aggressive, I support that. Uh, but then when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, like we did the McClary bill a few years ago, we had to do a giant property tax increase to fund our K 12 schools to care teachers care. I voted for that bill. The big argument at the time was well, we should have done 
a blend between a capital gains tax and a property tax. And so then when a bill comes forward on the capital gains tax, and I say, okay, I'll support that bill, but all the money we get from the capital gains tax has to go and reduce the property tax we increase. Well, then all of a sudden, nobody wants to support that bill anymore. And so I feel like progressive taxation isn't just creating a bunch of new taxes. Progressive taxation is raising one tax and lowering a different tax. And <coughs> my frustration in Olympia is that is hard to do because it seems like the focus is Let's create a new tax. Well, which one are you going to lower? Well, nobody wants to lower something. They just want to generate the new taxation. And, and that's where I think, I don't know, I've been more pissed and conservative, I think, than my caucus in general on a lot of these issues. And, and we have a specific bill around <coughs> and affordable housing in front of us this session. Uh, King County right now can go out and go to the people to do a 0.1% sales tax increase to do affordable housing. They have that. They could have everyone vote on it right now. I think we might vote for that, to be honest, if they gave us the option, I don't know. Last time they chose to go out for arts funding. That was the 0.1% in 2016, and, and Executive Constantine made a choice to go for the arts funding over affordable housing, and it failed. I think that was a mistake on his part. Well, the bill says we want to give King County Councilmanic authority to go out and do that sales tax increase for affordable housing. And I'm not going to support that in the sense that if if they want to do it, make their case to the people and have the people vote in the extra sales tax on affordable housing. If their argument is we need to have the city, the King County Council vote for it, well then, I'm like, well, <coughs> if the people want to do it, they'll vote for it. Like, they, you have that authority, put it on the ballot right now in, in November of 2020, and let's see what happens. But if you're afraid they're going to vote it down, that isn't a good reason to give the authority to the County Council to just impose it. So, I don't know. But I am, I will be a transparent. I'm not at all. How the state can work to close uh, the Cedar Hills landfill. <laughs> Your front page of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> All eagles. Yeah. Um, so, so there is a difference because one day that the, it's a county landfill is under the authority of King County, so we do not have direct authority. But I can tell you, I personally have talked to every county council member. And they know I'm very highly interested in everything they do with that. And some of that pressure has gotten them to uh, start looking much more quickly at trying to find the next alternative because it is coming to a close one way or another um, because it was passed as used to life about 25 years ago. Um, and somehow it was surviving in zombie like fashion. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, so that we have to find a solution for that. It's coming to a close. And the push to that to step up and do it. The problem is, no solution is going to be cheap, but that's one of the things we have to find. Our district is literally the dump of the, the, of the county. So we have a, a more interested note than some of the other districts do. And, and I, I can promise you that I'm talking constantly about that and work with folks on that and keeping the pressure on the county to, to do the right thing and step up and find the alternative and implement as soon as possible. And 
I think that's one of the important things is that we need to bring more support and weight to our um, county council representatives on this issue and certainly showing up on that. I know the Seattle, um, I think it was Seattle, I think it was that had some um, decisions where they were going to transport their waste to the compost or something to a community. The community was outraged. They showed up on their doorstep and said, look, you've got to look at this world of the Indian impact of this and what it's doing. And I think. Um, Raymond and, and Kathy have been alone on this battle. Um, we need to make sure we're bringing the signal strength and heat and sharing that across and, and adding weight from our local municipalities to the support of this county to make it happen. So thanks for all of your support. Yeah, one positive. We did have huge positive success with Cedar Grove from the compost facility down there. Well, we've been fighting them in the middle, saying that nobody's allowed to sue Cedar Grove if they produce odors. And, and President Ramos has been a huge, you know, leader on that one and that whole issue on the House side and, and we won that issue this year. I think they finally agreed to back off from the bill they've been running year after year the entire time I've been down there. And we actually found something much more positive that they could support. Yeah. Um, is there any way that you can find out what the tipping fee is to the um, consumer? That has not been studied or released ever. They will not. They will not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> question we have here is uh, do you support public employee personal data um, not being subject to public uh, records act having been a federal civil servant most of my life um, most information about public employees is public data but I think there's a few pieces of the piece of uh, legislation we just passed that doesn't need to be that is truly just personal data we talked about per day um, it uh, doesn't need to be out of other folks so that they can use some of that information to either harass, bully, or possibly you know, steal IDs. So there are a couple little pieces that, that shouldn't be, but the rest of the information on public employees is pretty public information. So if the House bill is passed, it will be coming to the Senate. Yeah, we'll send it your way. <laughs> Uh, the next question is, uh, is there, is it true that Amazon doesn't pay its fair share of taxes and what, and what is being done about that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know the specific data on what Amazon's paying, but I do know that they were at the table um, and have been at the table in a couple of conversations that are happening with the business round table, which is a, a table that really brought forth some of the legislation that has uh, passed last session is being talked about um, this session. So the Workforce Investment Act, uh, Amazon and Microsoft were at the table of really trying to figure out ways where they could provide, um, you know, there would be no tax that was applied 
Collins' credit, they did work very positively with me on that entire issue where they ended up getting a national stand saying we should have internet sales tax everywhere. And, and so we were not fighting Amazon on that, we were fighting eBay on that. eBay was the one who was kicking and screaming at the bitter end when we passed the bill a couple years ago saying everyone's going to pay sales tax. And no, I mean, that, and that dovetails in the sound transit. Like, that's one of the reasons I think we can change the depreciation schedule. Because of that internet sales tax bill, sound transit had way more money coming in than what they originally expected. Because you know what? There was a lot of sales tax money just being left from these out of state companies that were selling products here are now finally having to bring the money into our state treasury. And that's one of the reasons we have more money now than we expected. So the next question is, uh, this person wrote that they don't support uh, the recent privacy uh, bill that passed the Senate, and they wanted uh, your position on it and kind of why, and they, uh, the reason they were opposed is because it doesn't go far enough. So um, I believe that's a Senate-specific specific bill. Oh, I don't know. I voted for the bill. I, I support it. And, and I say this all the time, in Bolivia, and I, I never quite figured out opposing a bill because it doesn't go far enough, and then doing nothing is not is not a great option. And that's what happened on privacy last year. That bill died because people said, "Well, it doesn't go far enough." And then the reality is, we had no bill, and now we don't know what companies do with our personal information and how they sell it and what control we have over it. This bill, at least, is incremental progress. I can. Guarantee you it is 100% better than not having a bill this session around privacy because then there, there are companies in this world who make their entire living off selling your personal information. And so the idea is it's new, but we should start regulating it. And, and I 100% think that bill moves us in a step in the right direction. And I know the Senate screwed up some House bills. This is, <laughs> this is a Senate bill that I think is good that the House has been screwed up, but we will see. Uh, you know, and the reality of why I'm not super optimistic on that bill, it just comes down to personalities of different chairs of the committee in Olympia. I mean, there's 98 House members, 49 senators. The chair of the Technology Committee in the Senate and the chair of the Technology Committee in the House do not agree on this bill. And the reality is, when that happens in Olympia, nine times out of ten, you get no bill. And that's my fear is what's going to happen again on that issue. But we'll see. Here and I'm almost out of time. Uh, I will do uh, this last. This will be the last question. Uh, it's another big one. Um, so, uh, what what Washington State initiatives do you see as leading the way towards national initiatives? So, what is how is Washington on the front end in terms of things? Uh, I mean, it's hundreds of millions of dollars that have come into our K-12 system. I mean, through the taxing of marijuana, that was obviously an initiative that was passed by those people the year I ran for the Senate the first time in 2012. And I will say, other states have come here because of how well we're tracking where it's grown, what happens to the process, we kind of create this three-tier system where you, you can be a grower, you can be a transporter, you can be a retailer, but if you can't have Called vertical integration, we own the entire thing, and uh, and I would say that initiative is actually one of the better crafted initiatives in the sense that there's been a lot of people in other states who, as marijuana has been legalized state by state, gradually have looked at us as a model of how to do it. Hey, Amos Mitchell here in the front row, Jackson, Philly, Jr.
Yeah, we had some. We had a question. Um, My question is yeah. the end Maybe not there. We have we have a bunch more questions that didn't get answered, and we'll try to respond to them. Uh, they will. If you want to come up afterwards and write your email down, you can well, have them. Each I was going to say you talk about Amazon. Is anybody up having to say and talk a bit about housing issues? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're here. And so, do you want to answer one more question on affordable housing? What's being done on on housing issues? That's not. No, I want to know what housing is for the very low income that don't meet the affordable housing requirements. Now, what I'd really ask of you, if you could do it in the budget, I think you could put it, you could put it things in the budget. I want a one day study of when you do how many people are homeless. I want you to do a one date and time on how many people are rent serving in affordable housing. They're rent serving, affordable housing is not working. And I want to know what about the people that live in the very low income? There's no housing for them. So affordable housing is not an answer for most people. So I would like the statistics of affordable housing. How many are actually renters? And we don't take that data, like how we count how many homeless. Why don't we do a date and time study to say how many people are rent burdened and their only option is affordable housing? I would love to see that statistic. We so I was hoping in the budget you could throw it in at the minute, okay, we're going to throw this money out of housing, but now we're going to do a date and time one day a year to see if. Or yeah, I think we should be able to get uh, some staff answers. If you want to come up afterwards and give us your information, we could probably get you that information. So uh, really, I'll take it. I've already tried to get it from the tax, the housing tax yeah. commission. They, yeah. But they're in La La Land. They think it's great and everybody thinks it's just not working. Yeah. I mean, that's the big thing. There's a lot being done to make investment. I mean, we banned sorts of income discrimination two years ago, saying no one was allowed to reach out section eight vouchers anymore. And that was about the capital budget that the Senate released this week, I think the House would be similar. I mean, it was only a $75 million capital budget. A third of that went into housing. I mean, $15 million of that was in shelter beds to try to help people who are literally, we're trying to get people directly off the streets. And I think you're, you have a fair point that a lot of people are paying, I think we try to say it's affordable if you're paying roughly 30% of your income towards rent, but a lot of people I know through my staff at Seeds and Ben and Jerry's who are paying 50% of their income, First rent, that is very normal. That is a hard, I know people hate hearing this, but it's, it's hard for us through the, through, you know, signing our name on paper to change that overnight. It is just really hard to also make everyone's rent 30% of their income. But senior citizens, it would be really great. All three, them, all three of them need to answer. So it would be really okay. great if you could let them have uh, time to answer fully. So when you talk about the investments, but I think certainly in the conversations that I've been having over in the house, we are talking about um, one, what is the definition of affordability, right? So there's workforce housing, there's the 80% of the MI, there's 30%, and what does that mean and what does that look like? And staying housed, so rent burden falls into that. And I think that I was at um, a session during the interim summer that had a lot of data around that that talked about the rent burden um, and mortgage burden of trying to figure out where that is depending on the region. So I think there's some data out there that certainly was driving some of the legislation that was being brought forward. Um, some of the legislation that was being brought forward this session is tied to uh, revenue stream ideas. Um, that means that they're trying to figure out ways to pay for providing assistance in those areas. So that makes it a, a more complex conversation to have, right? Um, but I think they're there and I can talk to you about some specific bills afterwards that we're yeah, um, and then huge investments in the housing trust fund. Um, and so there's also, you know, I know, and so you're talking about affordable housing, how does that get managed? And so there's also, actually also some legislation that's come through around um, the housing trust, trust fund itself and how that's actually being managed and worked too, since you're actually seeing some um, more transparency on how that is working, which I think will help and be, not from my own perspective, will be helpful. Yeah. Just add a little more to all that. Is, is one of the things that I, I like to work on is maintaining the housing that we have is in a world status. And that's where we tend to unfortunately start losing housing for one reason or another. Neighborhoods change, it increases, people upgrade their houses, they tear down and replace them with, and we lose those units. And every time we lose a, lose a unit that is in affordable workforce housing area, it's almost impossible to replace it. So I like to focus in on that, but it is difficult. I have seen some.
uh, statistics also. Uh, I got those folks that are read for it. I, I don't remember where they were from, but I'm sure we can find them again. Um, and looking at that, that is a big issue. And, and some of that is that mix of, we have a dynamic here of the marketplace. Housing prices, rental prices, is kind of a marketplace issue. And so for the government to enter into that is, is not an easy thing to do. Like, you can't take control of that because there's economics in play. And how you can support that and try to play with that to increase things along the way, uh, unit-wise, is, is difficult. We're having those discussions now, but it's not an easy answer when you have an area like this where the, the price of housing is rising so quickly due to supply and demand issues that just makes it a, little, a lot harder. So I think we're going to wrap this up. Yeah. All right. Because um, we're out of time. So I want to thank you all. I will be here. I think all of us be here a little bit. Please um, get your uh, number down here in email. We'll talk to you more. In the interim, we are more available with a lot more time. We're going to have some copies. We'll be around and love to have some meetings with, with you more uh, after a few weeks of getting this, this batch of it done. I do my meetings at Ben and Cherries. <laughs> <laughs> right by you guys. Um, and, and so, so um, I want to thank. So thank you all for coming, really taking your time. So we'll be here. Thank you politely and all for your